Okay, so welcome everybody to our weekly session. Um, today's interview, we are going to discuss behavioral change and how do we motivate ourselves for changes lifelong. Um, Dr. Louise Schofield is here today with us and she is going to help us do exactly that. So thank you, Louise, for taking the time out to join us today. Um, I feel very fortunate to count Louise as a wonderful friend and a professional colleague. Um, she's an amazing woman who is making real change in the low-carb world. And I'm just going to read you a bit of her background because I won't remember it all because she's amazing. Louise has got a PhD in behavioral change, so you know why we've interviewed her today. She spent the last 15 years in the corporate health and well-being sector, the co-founder and CEO of Precure, which is training and accrediting health coaches, which is what I'm going through at the moment, and I cannot speak highly enough of it. You know, I often talk about going through Precure and the different modules I'm doing, so we'll talk about that at the end of the video. But also, Louise is the absolute powerhouse behind the scenes of What the Fat and What the Fast. Again, two books that I'm always telling you guys you need to go and get and you need to read. So welcome, Louise, to Ditch the Carbs Tribe and Membership. And thank you for joining us today. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you, Libby. What, what, um, what a fantastic introduction. Can I just say, all of that makes me sound absolutely fantastic. And you uh, are. Of course, I'm just a real, exactly the same as probably a lot of our listeners. So do you know what? I drink too much. I have rude children. Once I made my husband, Professor Grant, so embarrassed that standing in the middle of the local supermarket, he stood on the spot with his eyes shut for two minutes, hoping to disappear. So I am very, very, very normal and have a lot of challenges, just the same as everyone else. And I'll tell you some of the stories behind those uh, drinking too much, rude children and embarrassing husband as we go through. <laughs> but do you know what, that's brilliant. That shows us that we are all real people, you know, and we all make mistakes. We all are not perfect. But you know what, we're all trying our best. And that is what I think is the biggest thing is that we are all trying what we can do with what we have at the time in our life that we have. And if that's only making baby changes, you know, that's my thing that I keep on telling everyone is that stepwise, if we can only do 1% improvement or anything, that's better than just not doing anything. And we're all trying our best, you know? Exactly. You know, I often say we, we overestimate what we can achieve in the short term. Yes. But we grossly underestimate what we can achieve in the long term. Yeah. And that might be to do with business, that might be to do with weight loss. It doesn't matter whatever you think, you know, sometimes we, we, we think through short term and we think, oh, I want to lose 10 kilos and do this and do this and do this and I want to do all of that in the next six weeks. And that might not be realistic. Mm. But if you extend that time frame out and you take it over the long term, you can do anything. And, and I think that's a, that's a key to behaviour change. Actually. Absolutely. And I always say when I went low carb or whatever change other people want to make, but when I went low carb, I think it took me six months to become low carb. And then I took, I think it took probably a whole year for the whole family to go low carb. And it's like, well, imagine if some people had started a year ago where they would be now. They don't yeah. have to do like, you know, a quick, you know, 10 day challenge and then that's it. Um, yeah. so, so I think that's a really valuable tip. And so going on to today's topic, what do you think or why do you think lifelong habits are so hard to get them lifelong and to get them, you know, more than just a week's challenge or a, a 30 day challenge? You know, why do you think they're hard to make it lifelong habit changes? <laughs> Gosh, I, I think that that's a that's a really hard one. Um, we I just behaviour change. I say to people, it is hard, and it, yeah. and it's easy. And but I think mainly is because we rely too much on willpower. Now, willpower is grossly um, overestimated. We can't. Everybody's willpower is actually a lot worse than what we think it is. So, so I think when you know we do a we do a challenge maybe for 10 days or 21 days and if we go into it and we say I'm just going to do this and I'm strong and I'm going to make it um, inevitably we will fall over so it, it is absolutely about changing your environment changing everything you can to make it the healthy choice the easy choice and mm. not so much on willpower so I think that's probably one of the reasons um, the, the other reason is we, we live in a, in a world that is quite tough you know uh, 
academics describe it as an obesogenic environment or uh, everywhere we look. That's actually really true, isn't it? It absolutely is. You know, sports yeah. fields, when we drive everywhere, it is just everywhere. Yeah, food, um, lack of activity. And it's just, so that makes it quite hard, mm. um, I think. And, and also the other reason that behaviour change is hard is, is we're really busy. We've got a lot going on in our lives. And um, I think we do try and do too much at once. I'm, I'm very guilty of that. We try and make um, a whole lot of changes um, set it up, rely on our willpower, and then we inevitably can get disappointed when suddenly we're not magically a different a different person. Exactly, exactly. And it's funny, I'm reading a book at the moment called Do Less, Be More. And I thought yeah. that's that's exactly, exactly right. We 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 need yeah. to learn to do less and be give ourselves more grace and give more self, take the pressure yeah. off ourselves to go do what we can with what we have right now and if that's all I can do now then that's great and then maybe next week or next month I might be able to build upon that and sort of improve upon that but yeah I absolutely think and I think you've spoken to before about we have these triggers that the, you've got these three step loops that you've talked about before the three steps that you can change you know, the trigger the routine the reward what's that all about to help us kind of losing certain parts that we want to lose <laughs> Sure. So look, I think um, the, the, the human brain is always trying to make our behaviours into a habit mm. because otherwise there's just too much to deal with on a daily basis. So right from when we we're first born, uh, the human brain will try and make a particular behaviour into a habit. And actually, um, we now estimate well over 40% of the decisions we make on a daily basis, those are actually just habitual decisions that have been automated. So while we might think that we're choosing um, every behavior that we do, quite often we're actually not. And so I think that just understanding that your, your brain is trying to automate or make habitual your behaviors is, is important. And of course, habits can be a positive thing or they can be quite a negative thing. Mm. So when you break down a habit, we break it down into, into three parts, as you just said. So number one, there's always something that triggers a behavior. Mm. Number two, there's the routine or the actual behavior. And then whenever we do something, there is some sort of reward. Now, it might not be uh, an extrinsic reward, it might be something internal. But, but when we think about it as a, ha a habit, the habit loop is something will trigger the behavior, we will then do the behavior or the routine, and then there will be some sort of reward, even if you're not recognizing it. So what we know when we're trying to establish healthy behaviors, um, or, or maybe stop an unhealthy behavior, is first of all, identify what's the trigger. But so something for me, um, a while ago now, but when I was first setting up a previous business, I got very stressed and, and, and a trigger was I would come home from work and my way of de-stressing would be to have a glass of wine. So it really got to the stage that when I came in the house, I would pour myself a glass of wine and it was my, the trigger was I'm home from work, I deserve this, I've had a busy day. And then and it just became habitual and I would pour that glass of wine. Yeah. Yeah, was, was drinking the wine. And then, of course, you do get that little buzz. When you first start, you do get that little buzz. Obviously, as we now know, it's, um, it doesn't last and you end up feeling worse. But there is a reward there. But it changed that behavior. Yeah. So, you know, I had to change the trigger. So it was changing, actually, not coming straight in the door. Um, you know, I had to have another behavior to replace that with. Um, and so it was really working to change. You've got to break the habit loop. So it could have been there um, or, or at other parts. So that's really the, the habit loop. Exactly. And I remember you giving me example in Precure. Um, you gave the example of the mum who would drive past McDonald's every night and she would want, not want to go to McDonald's and she would not want to take her children there. So the trigger was driving past. So now to avoid the trigger, she drove around another way. And so she avoided that whole trigger reward. And the reward is that she got McDonald's or the children got McDonald's. You know, so people could think, okay, well, instead of driving by McDonald's, I drive a different way. And I run into the supermarket and I get maybe a rotisserie chicken and a bag of salad. And boom, dinner is still organized quickly, cheaply, easily. But I'm not going past or whatever that trigger may be. So I think that's really valuable. 
Exactly, exactly. Change change that uh, that trigger it's as easy as it sounds. Just don't drive that loop. Because exactly. again, we overestimate our willpower. Yeah. You know, first get up in the morning and you feel good and everything's going well. You think in that moment, I'll be fine tonight. I won't my it's gonna be good, but tell you what, when you get something goes wrong and something else happens and your willpower is a limited resource. So yeah. rather than having to draw on it at five thirty when the kids are arguing in the back and you know you haven't got dinner made and you've got to drive past that McDonald's, <laughs> actually just make it easier on yourself. Yeah. That's the thing with behaviour change. Yeah. Make it easier on yourself, drive it through. <clears throat> So and I, we've just we've in the sort of in the course and in the website and everything I often discuss about you know that's why low calorie and eating less and moving more has failed us because it relies on willpower so much and it, does. it addresses that per, the sort of underlying problem of our hunger and habits yeah. and everything else and willpower whereas you know when you go low carb and you're eating lower carbs and higher healthy it addresses that you know the problem of hunger which we has never been addressed before because we're always hungry we're eating less we're doing more kind of thing so um yes. so yeah exactly and what would you say to people who who put their happiness on hold once they've lost their weight or once they've you know um they've some kind of life goal but they sort of they say oh i'll be happy when i've lost 10 kilos or i'll be happy when i've done this and so then if that doesn't happen then that affects their behavior negatively as well Yes, look, unfortunately, the human condition is that we habituate very quickly. So we might say, very typical that I hear clients say is, if I could just lose five kilos, then I will be happier. My husband will love me more. I will be a better person. I will look better. I will, and, and, and these are not good thought patterns to be having because you, you know, you can't, your life is happening now. And, and so I think absolutely, not saying don't have a goal of losing five weight, yep. five kilos, that might be a great thing to do. But don't decide that you're not going to be happy until that happens. Mm -hmm. What happens is you, you will lose your five kilos and you'll get there and, and um, you will momentarily feel great. But suddenly, you know, you will read, this is what the human brain does, it will be another goal. You will immediately, oh, well, now actually I would be happier if I could lose another five or if only this could happen. Yeah. That, the human condition, we are all like that. So what we're saying is um, absolutely have goals, but be mindful of what is happening now. This is your life happening now um this is um you know it's it, it, it's the journey of coming to lose the weight it's the journey um that you're going through so, so i think that's just a really important it's not just to do with weight loss either it could be to you know any goal that you have and it's just very much that concept of mindfulness i just wanted to tell you a really quick story you, you probably yeah, yeah. heard it maybe, but my um um, my middle child, his name is Jackson. And he's actually now 16. But for his fourth birthday, we uh, did him a noddy cake. And so, <laughs> it wasn't, so it was back in before before low carb. And I guess so it wasn't a low carb cake, but it was a, it was a noddy <laughs> birthday cake. I don't even know if noddy's a fashion anymore. I don't think so. <laughs> so we gathered Jackson and his friends around this cake. And, you know, the kids, like, they pull out the cake. It's all over the cake and it's like, oh God. Just before he did that, we said, Jackson, we'd like you to make a wish. And he thought, oh, I've never heard of that. You know, and so we talked to him about how we should make a wish. So he does that, spits all over the cake and he makes a wish. And straight away, we said to him, well, Jackson, what did you wish for? And he looks up at Grant and I incredulously and he says, a piece of cake. In the moment. That is in the moment. When you were four years old, what else are you going to wish for on your fourth birthday? We're thinking about a bike or, you know, he goes to school next year or maybe his university education or, because, of course, we as adults have immediately okay. gone. Um, and children, they live in the moment. Yeah. In the moment is now. And I think um, that is a really important concept. And yeah. particularly for, for those 
you know, the listeners out there who are emotional eaters, mm. that's a real key as well. I have been an emotional eater since I was 16 years old. Yep. I remember eating through a whole packet of chocolate fudge cookies when my first boyfriend wrote me a letter and told me that he actually thought someone else was nicer than me. So I, 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 my emotional eating started. Oh I know. How do you eat? Um, <laughs> And, um, and I ate through that whole packet of biscuits. And of course, what I was trying to do there, I was trying to numb the pain. Yeah. I was trying to numb. And I thought that by eating those biscuits, I could numb that pain. Mm. And, um, of course, we know that actually doesn't happen. But it, it's, it's being able to, in that moment, um, you know, just, just understand that actually the human condition is not about being happy all the time. Mm. And I think... We, we need to understand that actually to live a full and meaningful life, there'll be periods when we, we, we're, we're happy, but there will also be sadness. Yes, um, and we need to feel those and, feelings. Yeah. We, we do. And there might be anger um, and, and there might even be guilt. And sometimes we think about these as negative emotions. But what I'd like to say is, in fact, those negative emotions can be used for good so actually anger is a very motivating emotion um, when anger turns to rage well that's no good yeah so, so that we're not after rage and actually a bit of anger man that can get you going and get you motivated <laughs> and, you know my um um, I have to be careful, and she may listen to this, so I won't actually no, say. No, that. Any <laughs> someone, um, someone, um, my wider family, mentioned to a friend of mine the other day. Oh gosh, Louise has put on a few kilos, something like that, and I got, I got angry. I was like, how dare she? I'm trying hard, and I'm doing this, and then, but you know what? man, I've actually been a bit more mindful and, and, and I've been Probably motivated you to, and, and some people will motivate, I'm going to show you. <laughs> exactly. And that it was, it was very much like, well, I'm going to show you. And, yeah. and so that, that's good. That's using a negative emotion for good. Yeah. And I, this is the same thing when we talk about um, guilt. I actually have a saying that guilt is good and shame is shit. So <laughs> I love that on, on this. But, um, but, but, you know, don't be afraid to use some of your guilt to help you change your behavior. That's not a, again, it's not a comfortable feeling. It's, it's, it's uncomfortable. Uh, actually, guilt does help us to be better parents, to be um, better partners, and yeah. to change our health behavior. But when you're, you know, if you, if you have um, a glass of wine and, and three Tim Tams, and you feel a bit of guilt about that, that's okay. Yeah. If that turns to shame and you can hear yourself going, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeless, I'm a bad person, I can never do this, then that's shame. Yeah. Shame needs secrecy and judgment to thrive. And so I think we just need to be careful that emotions like anger and guilt, use them to help you get better it's, but be aware that when they become rage, well, that's not going to be useful. Yeah. Also, particularly when guilt becomes shame. Yeah. Uh, then that, that's not going to work either. So. And I think that's really, like I've had a lot of people in the group and they will say, oh, I've had a really bad weekend. I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. Or somebody went and they had, or had takeouts and they ate everything that was there. And she says, oh, I feel so bad. And I said, no, I said, this has taught you the most valuable lesson and it's a bit like you're saying you know you've got to understand that emotion don't feel the shame you can feel the guilt but okay I shouldn't have done that but remember that feeling to go okay you know what next time I always say you either stop the splurge or you limit the splurge so next time I said just go and think to yourself okay if that situation presents again okay if all your family's having a big takeout have some of that takeout but just don't go to excess because you'll remember back to what you felt like back then and don't feel like you say perfect don't feel the shame just feel how remember how you felt afterwards and you don't want to feel like that again so next time it will happen it won't happen so badly you, you won't right. have everything you'll yeah. just have it less and next time it was a chinese takeout that they had and i yes. said well, next time maybe go and ask for bok choy and broth with everything yes. so enjoy like a little bit of rice enjoy whatever it is that you wanted but limit it to a small amount rather than the whole blowout. And I think that's exactly right. That's really important. I hadn't really associated the shame and the guilt being two different things, but very valuable 
and not desirable, the two different aspects of that, isn't it? Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then just to relate it right back to where we started, which was mindfulness, it is being mindful of how you are feeling. And yeah. it is okay to sometimes feel sad. It's okay to feel guilty. Mm. It's okay to feel those emotions. You don't need to go, oh, I don't like that feeling. I've got to stop it. I need to go and eat a packet of Tim Tams. I need to go. And one of the ways we know we can work through emotional eating is to, to, to identify the feeling and go, hang on why do I want to eat that whole packet of biscuits right now? Actually, I feel a bit sad. And yeah. then it's being kind to yourself and go, it's okay mm. that I feel sad. It's and okay. I, I know if I was, you know, and it still happens now, but I have to fight it. If I'm ever going at you know, an emotional eating for me, it's when there's something I don't want to deal with. So yeah. I know then you think to yourself, oh, what's in the pantry? And you go there and look and you think, actually, I'm not doing it because I'm hungry. I'm, I'm doing it because I know I've got an email to write or I know I've got a phone call to make or go to school and do something for the kids or something. And it's that learning what that triggers. And like you say, actually feeling that, okay, I really don't want to do whatever that is, but going into the pantry is not going to help the situation. You know? No, actually, you know it's going to make it worse. So yeah. it's, it's, it's just stopping for a moment letting feel that feel that feel the feeling we're not saying it's not uncomfortable because it is yeah uh, you're not alone everyone feels like that even the most perfect put together person i think often we think oh man they work just look at them i wish i could be like them they're so great. They're, no one is like that all no. the time everyone it is a norm normal human condition to, to, exactly. to Exactly. Yeah, now, we, you know, behavioural long, lifelong, and making these lifelong changes. Mm -hmm. I often talk about knowing your why, and yes. if you know why you've made a life, a health or um, fitness change or anything to prevent something in the future, I always say talk about your why. And mm -hmm. I know you talk about, you know, that you can go deeper and deeper and deeper. And how many times, or what, how far do you go to, you know, what, what do you think of is your why? Um, how do you get that out of people? How does that affect them? Yeah. Now look, this is this is absolutely the key to behaviour change. Yeah, it's understanding your why yourself if you're changing a behaviour, or if you're working with a client. As you've said, we train health coaches. Yeah, and this is probably you know one of the fundamental things to get right is helping people to understand why they want to change a behaviour, because um, it is going to get hard. And they will have to dig deep at some point and they really need to know why they're doing it. And if it's not, it's just because, oh, my mother-in-law thinks that I'm, you know, <laughs> carrying too much weight or, um, you know, if it's something not really personal, then it probably won't work. Mm -hmm. Another story, my, my dad, who's now in his mid seventies, um, but um, 18 years ago, his first grandson was born and his First grandson is my son and his name is Sam and back then dad's really struggled with his weight he was he was quite overweight he was actually the pool manager at um, Takapuna Aquatic Centre oh. and every day at 10 o'clock he would drive his car down a hill it's about 400 meters into what was then called Shore City and he at 10 o'clock he would have a trim flat white and a muffin I, I know this routine exactly because it's exactly what I used to do um, yes. every time I would go and see um, it was when I was pregnant with Benjamin and I would yes. do exactly the same thing once I'd seen my midwife I would then drive to Shore City and I would get oh. a flat white with a caramel yes. slice Those are my <laughs> there you go well, well dad had a muffin because he thought that was healthy like yeah. muffin is a piece of cake anyway and he would drive his car back up the 400 meters to the swimming pool and he did that every day and dad had four daughters and we were always trying to get him to eat better and he carried too much weight. He didn't care. He absolutely didn't care. There's nothing that we could say to make him change his behavior. But when Sam was born, after having four daughters, I sent him an invitation to Sam's 21st birthday. So this is 18 years ago when Sam was just born. And I said, dad, it's gonna be really sad at Sam's 21st birthday because you're not gonna be there to celebrate wow. with your grandson because dad really got to the stage where he needed to make some changes. And at that time I put a pedometer 
um, in his in the invitation. And Dad was wild with me. He didn't talk to me for a couple of weeks. Right? He was anger, really anger. Angry. He was angry. <laughs> he was it was anger. Okay, but that changed his behaviour. So his call to action. He didn't care what he looked like. He didn't care that he had a belly. He, you know, he hadn't really worried too much about um, the, the, the not being in good health. But mm-hmm. you know what? He wanted to be around for his grandsons. Yeah. And he wanted to be at that 21st. And he's only got now, he's got about two or three years to go. And he's in great shape. He's Excellent. In Shape. Um, you know, he, he eats lower carb. I wouldn't say it's low carb, but it's lower carb and he walks and he exercises and he changed his behavior because his call to action was being around for his grandchildren. Mm-hmm. So it was really for him, it was understanding that. So I think it's be very um, aware of what the call to action is. We use a technique called the five whys technique. And when you first start talking to someone, Say, well, well, you know, some I'd like to lose weight. Well, why would you like to lose weight? Oh, well, I'd like to look better. And that is probably true, but it's quite a superficial ask. Mm. Um, and so we just find, and say, oh, well, why would you like to look better? Oh, well, I'm, I'm getting, you know, I'm getting a little bit older now. I'm, in, I'm about to be 50 and I'm starting to notice some changes. And so then it's, um, and, and I'd like to, um, you know, I'd like to be able to sleep better. So you just keep, asking why mm. and eventually there will be you know the real it might be that actually um you know my mum got cancer when she was in her 50s and I'm actually really worried there's a family history about that or often we don't until we express it ourselves we are not sure about we don't really understand our own motivations mm. and that's what talking with someone can help so asking why of yourself, or ideally someone else will do it for you, up to five times, it's not a magic number. No. You might get to the real why in three, or you might get to there in seven. But the point is, never take someone's first answer. When we ask people, why don't you exercise more? I can guarantee you the first answer will be, I'm too busy. Yeah. Wow, bollocks. You know, actually, <laughs> I, know, I know we're really busy, but when you keep, if you keep asking why, you will get to, um, there'll be a real reason. Yeah. Very good doctors, for example. So our doctor at Precure, Dr. Chris Reed, a technique that he uses with patients, um, they might come to see him and they might have an ear infection or mm-hmm. and, and he'll talk to them about that. But he will always say to them, it seems to me like there might be something else on your mind. Is there oh, anything that's else a good you technique, about? yeah. That's really good technique and he says time and time again it'll be right near the end of the consultation after he has just probed and probed and probed and then the patient will say or you know his his patient will say actually of of of, um i'm really worried about my mental health or i'm also the real um the root cause of what's going on of the not sleeping or the ear infection or whatever it is will come out and I think um, we've just got to, yeah, we need to try and help people get to their real driver of their yeah. behavior. Five wise technique, try it. It's a good one. Yeah, yeah, I like it. And I think, I think kind of, you know, knowing your why, there can be the external struggle. Yes, we want to look better in our clothes. We want better clothes or whatever. But the internal struggle could be, actually, I don't want my friends to think that I've let myself down. Or, you know, actually, I want to avoid the health problems that my parents had. Or I want to avoid the health problems that I know I'm starting to see the signs of, rather than, yes, I want to lose 10 kilos. But actually, the deeper question is, there's health issues at play here. And that's, people will think it's secondary, but it's actually the driving force. And when, you know, I always think, you know, knowing your why, it's so much easier to refuse or turn down like a piece of cake when somebody's giving you rather than I shouldn't have that piece of cake actually I don't want that cake because I don't want to get type 2 diabetes Alzheimer's whatever it is in the future and knowing that is a deeper sort of feeling as to why it's it's easier to kind of you know make lifelong changes yeah Yeah. Yeah. and you talk about the seven rules of behavior change what are those yes okay so remember this be a memory test (laughs) Yeah, and I'm like, oh, um, so look, you try and keep it simple for people. But rule number one is know your why. So if you don't understand why you're doing something, um, then it's probably not going to succeed. So we've talked about that. Um, make sure you're really committed. Don't um, 
um, don't go low carb if it's not something that you particularly want to do. And I know we're going to talk about that later um, in terms of how, if you're low carb, how do you get your family to go? But um, you you personally have to understand why you're doing it. So that's really important. The second thing is that behavior change, it can be fun. So just do anything possible to make it fun. So if your behavior changes, for example, um, you want to get fitter and you have always hated running, don't it's say, done. not next week I'm going to start running because no, go back and go, actually, I used to, when I was 15, I used to do jazz ballet. Well, go and find a dancing class and do dancing. Class. Yeah, yeah. It is fun. Yeah. Um, I think that's a key to making it sustainable. Again, because when it comes back to that willpower, you want to enjoy what you're doing. Mm. So, so that rule number two is, is make it fun. Rule number three is make it as easy as you can. Make it as easy as possible. So that's making the healthy choice the easy choice. I struggle. I love ice cream. Absolutely love ice cream. I don't buy ice cream and have it in the freezer. Yeah. Because most of the time, yeah, my willpower is, is okay. And, um, you know, I won't go and have it. But I tell you what, if I decide that I really want to eat ice cream, it's a lot bigger um, challenge for me to get up, get in my car, drive to the supermarket, get the ice cream. I probably won't bother. Yes. If I just get up off the couch, walk to the freezer and there's the ice cream. Um, you know, like it's, again, um, you know, we're all fallible as humans. So make the healthy choice the easy choice. Set up your environment um, to help. To work with you, not against you. Mm. Back to the lady, change your route. Don't drive past the McDonald's or whatever the trigger is to go in and get the takeaway. So make the healthy choice the easy choice. Make it a habit. So so do try and get into a routine as quickly mm. as possible. So back to that example, coming home from work, I was in the habit of getting the wine glass, getting the bottle of wine, pouring a glass of wine and just going, oh, now I can relax. Now I can relax. And, I needed to replace that with another routine as quickly as possible. Yep. So it might be coming in the door straight away, having a shower and under the sh and then go, now I can relax. It might yep. be, you know, whatever it is for you, but change, make it, make it whatever routine a habit as quickly as you can. That's mm -hmm. particularly important for exercise and fitness. Yeah. Um, you know, go at the same time, uh, meet the same people and just all of a sudden you're just doing it by rote. Um, you're not having to think. Um, involve other people. I think sort your support. Have Do it with people. It's more fun. Yeah. Um, whether, you know, if you want to um, increase your fitness, try and um, yeah, get, get some friends involved. If you want to lose weight, get some, get some mates to do it with you. So Get a you buddy know, or a trainer. <laughs> Exactly. And um, number seven is track and measure your progress. So we all like to, we just need to see that we are getting better. Yeah. So, you know, we talked about make small improvements. So it's really important to, to be able to say, actually, I started here and I've just got this little bit better. Mm. So it might be, um, you know, if you can afford it, something like a Garmin or a Fitbit is really great for measuring your steps or, and your exercise and quite motivating. Um, but it might even just be, you know, jumping on the scales or taking a before picture or but anything that can help you measure your progress yeah. over and, and tracking it. So it's recording and measuring your progress. So number one, know your why. Um, number two, make it as fun as possible. Yeah. Number three, make your behavior um, as easy as you can in your life. So find a way to make it easy. Make it a habit. Involve other people, track and measure progress. And actually, I missed one out, which is about being positive. Yeah. Um, being, be, be kind to yourself. Be positive with yourself. Yeah. Um, Whenever you can, um, you know, just, just be aware of that, uh, that what you're playing in your head, those words that you're using, and be kind for yourself. Uh, absolutely. I think those seven tips, and I was going to ask you your top three tips, but I think those seven tips have pretty much covered it all. Um, mm. it is, it's it's mm. changing your environment and making it fun and enjoying the process. And that's what I always say is like, yeah. enjoy the journey of getting there. You know, it's not going to happen overnight. So enjoy it, you know, enjoy finding, like at the moment we're going through a, um, 
our sort of motivation for, or our monthly topic for this month is all about fitness and activity. And I tried not to use the word exercise because yeah. some people hate it. And I said, it's just about movement. It's just about activity yeah. and make it fun. You know, it could be walking to a hobby. It could be yeah. as simple as that. It could be walking around the block and taking photos of whatever it is you want to take photos of, but make it fun and enjoy the journey of both the diet, you know, the food that we change and the activity that we change, just enjoy it. You know, that's, it's, um, yeah, bring it on. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so now exactly. I think they're fantastic. I think there's seven rules or seven little tips, I think sums everything up. So now I want to ask you all about pre-cure. And then I've got three questions yeah. from my membership that I'm going to ask you from three of my members. So that's their little bonus of having the questions answered by you. So you started pre-cure, which is absolutely fa fabulous. And it's all about training and accrediting health coaches. But what impact do you think? So tell us about pre-cure and what impact do you think that's going to have on the future of health care and health span versus lifespan? Okay. Oh, great. Look, um, at Precure, we want to change medicine. So we want to change medicine to be more preventative and focused. Yep. We believe that prevention is cure and lifestyle is medicine. Yes. We, yeah. So we need to get to the root causes of disease and stop treating the symptoms. Mm. Um, we believe food first. So let's change the food environment before we put someone on um, what are we, whatever drugs we may be talking. Yeah. There seems to be a real sea change happening. And we believe in medical professionals. We want to help and support yeah. them. We want to help and support them to get more preventative and focused. Yeah. And the system is, it's really hard. You know, for a GP, they have 15 minutes. It's very hard to work with someone. How are you going to get five whys out in 15 yeah. minutes? Uh, and the seven change. steps of behavioural change. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's harder than that. So we believe that um, health coaches are the missing link in mm. healthcare. So we really, um, one of the ways that we're going to change medicine is by training and accrediting health coaches to help support people change behaviour. Yeah. Um, and so, so that's what we're doing. We're also going to, we also provide ongoing continuing medical education for health professionals. Brilliant. Bringing the latest nutrition, fitness, um, psychological evidence mm -hmm. to professionals in a way that they can easily keep up to date and current and then prescribe it um, to their patients. Yeah. Um, and then thirdly, we have free intervention programs to help people get started. So we have a 21-day pre-cure habits program. Our next Excellent. One shortly, um, but it's just to help people eat better, move more and, and get going. So that's really um, about Freakia. We've got we've got world leading academics um, and also doctors. And um, we're very young, we're a new company, but we absolutely believe that we can um, make an impact and get the word out there that lifestyle is medicine. Absolutely. And I'm going through the course at the moment. And I'm absolutely loving it. And like I say, I tell anyone who would remotely listen to me, you've got to go through pre -cure. You know, you've got to, I think it's absolutely fabulous. And like you say, you've got this team of absolute world-class academics, um, um, you know, like you say, all the different medical professions. You've got a GP, you've got pharmacist, you've got, um, all, you've got Karen Zinn, who's the dietitian. Who else have you got? You've got um, the oncologist. Yes, I don't know all the names of them, but I know which ones you've got in your team. So you've yes, covered yeah. absolutely every aspect. And it's, it's, I absolutely love it. I really, really do. And what I love about your ethos is that you're improving health span, not like, I mean, obviously it will be lifespan, but it's the health span and it's that sort of, you know, disability free years, all of the things that we touch on in the course, I absolutely love. Absolutely, yeah, definitely. We've identified that we lose this, on average, a 15 year gap between expected lifespan and our healthy lifespan. So what that means is that the last 15 years of our lives, most people spend with some form of disability, mm. um, not at their peak health. And that's to do with the big four chronic diseases. So really, in the last 15 years of our lives, 
there are very, very few people who do not suffer from either diabetes or complications, from cancer, from um, heart disease or from dementia. Mm. And know that we can prevent these diseases. The yeah. science is now, it's very credible. Um, and we know this and it is to do with lifestyle. It is about what we eat. It is about how we move. It's getting enough sleep. And it's making sure that we are connected with other people and not yeah. isolated. Yeah. And having that kind of sense of purpose, yeah. sense of achievement in our life. It's, it's just everything. It's the whole holistic living yes. that, that you're, you're covering. I think it's absolutely brilliant. So anyone who's interested in Precure, I'll give you lots of links at the end of this as to where you can find out um, all about Precure. So now I've got my three questions for my membership for you. Um, so number one question was, how can we change our healthy eating behavior when those around us refuse to change their healthy eating habits as well? So say for example, I have a lot of women and their husbands and their children refuse to eat low carb or refuse to eat even if it's not low carb, they refuse to give up their junk food and their soda and things. What kind of things, how can we change or how can we help them? And if we can't help them, how can we change ourselves in that kind of situation? Sure. Look, it's, um, it's definitely not easy, but no. I think the first first um you know this is a this is a personal uh, a personal thing i think we've got to be very careful about judging other people yes and we can when we change to um to a lower carbohydrate or low carb diet we we can feel so good and we're just amazed and we think i've got to tell everyone about this <laughs> everyone, got to, you know this is and that so it comes from a good place yes Sometimes we can be a little bit overzealous. Yeah. And um, if you put yourself in the other people's shoes, they feel like they're being judged. Mm. Um, and I nobody, nobody likes to feel like that they're being judged. Yeah. And I think my advice, um, you know, I see it all the time. We let people will come around to, to our house for dinner or come around and they, they're nervous about, you know, what because all – and it's like – we're never going to judge. We're never going to judge you because we know we are absolutely not perfect. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think I think start from that place is, is the best way is by example. Yeah, um, and I think with your family and it's um, so it's you eat this way and you can do it by stealth a little bit. You are That's exactly often, what I tell them. <laughs> yeah, often you will be the nutritional gatekeeper in the house. You're the one who's doing the groceries and bringing the food into the house. Mm. You actually have quite a bit of power. Yes. Um, and so you can, you can, um, you know, don't do it all in one hit. Suddenly it's all just, you know, fruit, I mean, you know, vegetables and meat and, 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 and nothing yeah. else. Um, but by stealth, you can just slowly, you know, maybe, you know, you might be, get rid of the chips or we don't buy soft drinks anymore or, and you just slowly change the food that you're bringing into the house. And that's how we operate now. I have two teenage boys. I know that they sometimes have junk food. I've, I've, I've seen them. Um, yeah. You know, of course they do. They're teenage boys. But we're at Grant and I are okay with that. We know that when they're at home, the meals that we prepare for them yeah. are, low, you know, are healthy um, and they're not the junk food. And then if they then still go out and buy some, some of the time, which of course they do, that's okay. It's, yes. not, the it's, it's not the biggest part of their diet. Yes, yeah. And yeah. I think you know, the other interesting thing is, um, you can make little swaps like the cauliflower mash instead of the mashed potato on top of the fish pie. Yeah. Sometimes if you do that well enough, um, your husband or the or the kids they actually won't notice. No. Um, you know they can lots of you, cheese. Yeah, <laughs> just, just don't tell them. Yeah, you just reduce, um, reduce the number of loaves of bread you're buying. Just, yeah. Just, do it by do it by stealth. you you control what you bring into the house. Um, but also be very careful not to, to, to come across as judgmental. Show exactly. by example. Just show show by example. By and yourself. how how we did it is I initially I discovered low carb through Grant and through Karen and everyone else. And I decided to go low carb and I I'm never gonna be a short order cook. I'm not never gonna cook two meals. I never have, I never will. So what I would do is yeah, say, uh, the, our first meal, I remember oh, we always had, I made spaghetti bolognese with zoodles. 
And so I made sort of, I made some pasta for the children, the normal, regular wheat spaghetti, but I had it with zooters. And what I did with them is I did it half and half and they ate a bit of the zooters and they went, mm, well, it's not disgusting, but I'll try it. And then yeah. I slowly did it. And so I would make just one meal, but I would make like maybe an option of theirs. And then eventually, oh, I ran out of spaghetti one night. And so we had to all have zoodles and they ate it and they thought, actually, that's really nice. And then when I decided to introduce smashed cauliflower, I said, oh, I've got a new recipe. And I didn't tell them what it was. I just said, it's a new type of mashed potato. And, and I flavored the heck out of it. I put lots of salt is always the one. And I put, I think, garlic yeah. and cheese. And then we yeah. thought, this is really, really nice. And then we always, we used to play a little game where we'd say, right, what you can guess the ingredients. So I'd say, well, what do you think that I put into the mashed cauliflower? mashed potato tonight and they guessed that there was garlic and cheese and I said well did you know that that was actually mashed cauliflower and they went no way and so that's how I slowly introduced it and then we would cut out our cereals you know and I had bought I don't know I think it was like five boxes a week and then slowly it would go down to oh oh, what we would I mean you when you think we've got there's five in the house they're eating it for breakfast they quite often have it for afternoon tea and so yeah. I come back and I go, actually, yeah. I'm only going to buy maybe two or three boxes this week. Yeah. So they knew by Thursday it was gone. And then they got to have different things. So it, like you said, by stealth, we kind of slowly made changes. And mm. I set myself the goal of having one low-carb um, bread-free lunch box a week. And once I did one, that's all I wanted to do was just one a week. Yeah. And then I slowly went on going, you know what, I've got some ideas now what to make. I can now do two, two a week. And then again, it's like, you know, that stepwise approach and doing it quietly without making a big song and dance about it. Um, and when I've got, you know, people in the group and saying, you know, my husband doesn't want this or they don't want to give up their soda, I just say, well, just slowly stop to buy so much so maybe the end of the week they've run out or whatever. So like you yeah. say, we're the gatekeeper kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A- absolutely. Place. I'm a loving place. Exactly. I um I think Libby, something that you do amazingly well, and that I I always hear your voice in my head. You, you just go go slowly. Yeah. Go absolutely. Children, um, just just make it as you say. Start with one change in the lunch yeah. a week, and and just slowly. Um, because parenting is tough. It's hard yeah. enough, let alone throwing yeah. in the mix. Oh, by the way, everything you knew. It's no yeah. longer here. We're now going on to this place. So you yeah, slowly exactly. pick out little, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. You can look back in a year or even longer and your the diet your family is eating will be radically different. Yes, um, and I imagined, yeah. I imagined at the beginning and I kind of piled up mentally on the kitchen table all the bread and the sugar and the cakes and the cookies and the muesli bars we yeah. hadn't bought even over the last few months when I first started to change going, oh my goodness, over these last three months, I would have bought how many loaves of bread, how many loaves, you know, boxes of muesli bars, granola bars. And when you think of it that way, go, okay, we've still got a long way to go, but that's fine. But remember where we came from. I think that's the point. Yeah, Yeah. progress, not perfection. Exactly, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) So another question for you is for my members. We may get bursts of motivation for a week or a month, but how can we stop emotional eating that turns all of this upside down? But I guess that goes back to your feeling those emotions, isn't it? Yeah, I think you ask yourself, how do I deal with this situation right now? Yeah. And, 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 and identify I'm feeling sad mm. or I'm feeling angry. Identify the emotion that you're feeling. Literally, it sounds really simple, but just a stopping before you start shoving the food and just stop yep. and go, hey, why do I want to eat that whole packet of Tim Tams? Um, yeah, and just I do. Ident- back to your Tim Tams. <laughs> yeah, just identify, identify what the feeling is. Yeah. Then, so, so again, you've just slowed yourself down. Take some deep belly breaths. Take some mm. slow, deep belly breaths um, in your head you know, what can I do today that will make tomorrow better? Yeah. I think, you know, sometimes if you're having a really bad day um, or you're feeling very low, it's too everything that it's so overwhelming. So it's just, what can I do today that will make tomorrow better? And that, you know, eating a packet of biscuits or drinking a bottle of wine, you know, that's just going to make you feel horrible tomorrow. Yeah. And so, 
it doesn't mean that this will always magically stop your emotional eating, mm. but it often will work. It will slow you down and it is okay to feel a little bit of that pain. Mm. That's not I think just give yourself, that's really my, my, my top tip, give yourself that permission. What I can say is I am still an emotional eater, but it is way less a problem for me since I've gone lower carb. Mm, absolutely. I, I think it was a, such a change um, going lower carb. I remember after the first um, three or four months when it, it happened, I remember, I always used to be someone who at the supermarket would buy myself a little treat because, again, I deserved it, you know. So I'd, I'd Absolutely. The, and I'd, I'd be like, I used to quite fancy a Turkish delight. or See, now I'd just be like, that is so, so I could have. But anyway, a chocolate bar, and I'd just, and I would buy that, and I'd, I'd have it shoved in my face and eating it before I got to the car. <laughs> um, what was amazing to me is once I'd gone lower carb, it just didn't talk to me. Any, no, like it, just, it doesn't. I, I remember going home to Grant the first day when I just like, I felt so pow. I was just felt like, wow, that's so cool. I yeah. don't feel, um, I just, I couldn't understand. It was, it was just, a, you know, a, a, a revelation to me. Um, so, so look, I think going lower carb absolutely helps mm. um, with emotional eating, but emotional eating is a psychological trying to hide the pain. You're trying to stop yourself feeling some pain yeah and the thing to understand is that to be human is to experience some pain and it's mm. okay exactly it. yeah so. So our third and final question is and i i also get this as well is how do we deal with family and friends who are dismissive of low carb one of my ladies said the other day she went she went um home and her mother-in-law said oh you're not on that stupid diet again are you and yeah. it's just dismissive behavior or I often have people say to me oh there's no hope for me they ask me about it yeah. and then they just completely wipe out everything and I often say if people ask you why you've changed they're not ready to listen but if they ask you how they've changed yeah that's ready to kind of understand but it's that dismissive it's almost like it whitewashes everything oh there's no hope for me no that's ridiculous it's kind of that dismissive behavior you get from other rather than people going great look at yeah. you or you've really changed and you you really feel happy um yeah it's yeah. it's it's friends and family it is hard isn't it look again i think again sometimes it is i'd liken it to if you've decided that you're not going to drink um at, at a party and sometimes it um that someone will go, oh, go on go on just have one just have one or go on yeah. you know and it's it's what that person doesn't realize is they uh because you're you're not drinking or maybe you know because you're not eating the bread or the mm. they then feel that you're making a judgment on them or they feel that there's ah. something with them and it's so, so often that behavior i think it's just understanding that it's coming from um you know they're actually feeling some sort of inadequacy themselves or something mm. so again i i go back to not judging them and i just think I'm, this is how, um, you know, from the drinking example, I would say, you know, you know, I, I say, look, it's, um, it just wasn't drinking, just wasn't doing anything for me. Yeah. It wasn't helping. It, it yeah. wasn't. And it's just as simple as that. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's like, look, I actually found that um, eating a lot of bread and cereal just wasn't helping me. It just mm. wasn't, wasn't making me feel good. And, and I, I, think often, I often tell them, they say, have your kind of line ready when you go to parties. If people yeah. say, oh, you know, they're sort of yeah. dismissive or derogatory about going low carb, just say, look, I've discovered whatever they want to say, but it's just say, I've discovered carbs just don't agree with me and my life just feels so much better without them. And yeah. they still then I say dismissive. You can then go, oh, look, I hope you you know, can appreciate that or whatever or can accept that. But it's just that thing of, you know, saying, well, for me, I found that it didn't work for me. So, and, and, and like you say, I think it comes from a place of judgment. They think they're being judged and we're not. Yes. Not all, yeah. You know, so many mums have said to me, what on earth do you put in their lunchbox or what on earth do you feed your kids? Yeah. I couldn't do that. And I said, but you can do what you want to do. I'm not judging anybody whatsoever. Like you say, going to parties and things. Yes, I will always yeah. bring a low carb treat, like a low carb cheesecake or something. And it's yes. whatever's on to offer. I can always find something that is applicable. And if yeah. not, then actually I will still 
thank the host and, and enjoy something, but I will just enjoy something smaller sort of thing. Yeah. So, so yeah, so yeah. those are great, fabulous tips today, Louis. So thank you so much for joining us today. And I think yeah. everyone will get a real, um, a real motivating feeling from today about how to deal with their feelings, how to deal with emotional eatings and how to help break habits and do lifelong change. So thank you very much. And I will put um, some links below about how everyone can access Precure, What the Fat, um, everything like that. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me, Libby. And you're an inspiration as well. So good oh, on you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. <laughs>